Number 10, Velocity. Velocity, as her name kind of implies, has the ability of super speed. Although a pretty basic power, it is nonetheless incredibly useful. Imagine receiving a punch from someone who's moving near Mach 13. You're done. You ain't coming back. They punch you in the jaw. Sorry, you no longer have a jaw anymore. That's just how it goes. Velocity has been clocked at running at speeds of Mach 13, and she is actually holding back because she's afraid if she runs any faster, she could destroy the Earth. And she likely could. Without something like DC's speed force to bend the laws of physics, moving at such extreme speeds at ground level could do terrible things to the Earth's atmosphere, as well as possibly incinerating anything on or near her path. Just think about that for like a little bit. Cyberdata, the group that gave Karen Taylor the cybernetic enhancements that turned her into velocity and let her move at her crazy speed, also implanted Kevlar under her skin to prevent extreme damage from running at those speeds. I don't know, I feel like you gotta do a little bit more than that, but hey, I just work here. She also has a cybernetic device called the Brain Box that lets her process information at hyper speeds, which is something that at least won't destroy the planet. Number nine, Savage Dragon. The Savage Dragon is one of Image Comics' most popular and long lasting characters, and he has been around since his debut as just Dragon in Graphic Fantasy number no. one in June of 1982. Basically, the Savage Dragon woke up butt naked and with no memory in a burning field. He was a giant green man with a big old fin on top of his head and super ripped like most heroes are. Now, what he didn't know at the time was that he was actually an alien conqueror named Kerr who originally came to Earth to conquer it, but was betrayed by two scientists. He was an enhanced member of the alien race called the Krillin or Krylin, and his enhanced Krylin slash Krillin physiology gave him superhuman strength, agility and stamina, healing abilities and telepathic resistance. Now one of my favorite parts about this hero is that instead of joining a superhero team and being a typical hero, the dragon actually wound up being a member of the Chicago Police Department and helping with their super freak problem. I think it's kind of cool to ground a character like that, but the nature of his powers still leave him near the top of the list. Number eight, Mighty Man. Different from most of the heroes on this list, Mighty Man is less of a person and more of a power that is passed on from person to person. Mighty Man is a tall, handsome, and ruggedly built blonde man, even when that is definitely not what his host is. So for example, the current Mighty Man is actually a woman named Anne Samantha Stevens, who becomes Mighty Man whenever she caps her wrists together. The power was passed on to her from the previous host, Robert Bergman, who fought in World War II. When she's not a superhero, she's actually helping out other superheroes, such as being the nurse that helped the Savage Dragon recover when he was first found with no memory out in that burning field. The Mighty Man powers include flight, invulnerability, leadership, magic, stamina, super speed, and super strength. And it's honestly really easy to draw parallels between him and Shazam, and even the original Thor who used to transform from Donald Blake. Number Seven. Pit. The unfortunate thing about indie comics is that the two big guys, Marvel and DC, have done a lot of stuff already. So a lot of characters will be spins on originals, but honestly, sometimes they are way cooler. Pit is basically inspired by the Incredible Hulk, but I don't want that to undermine how cool he is. The giant ball of hulking muscle and rage is a combination of human DNA mixed with genetic material from a race known as the Creed. Pitt escaped from the laboratory where he was being studied, but was captured and trained to be an assassin. So that sets him apart already. While on a mission though, a child's consciousness was melded with Pitt's, and after this merger, he fled to Earth and found a young boy who is technically his genetic relative. Pitt is as crazy strong as he seems to look, and I don't know if you saw the super scary claws, but he has super scary claws, so that's kind of freaky. He also has a degree of telepathy and uses it to make himself an incredible tracker, establishing a mental link with whoever he's tracking, making him able to track them from the other side of the world. He also has emotional control, meaning he can unbalance other people's emotions in order to make them commit errors while fighting. And I don't know why I've never heard of another character doing that before, that's actually really cool. Whereas the Hulk gets stronger the madder he gets, Pitt uses pain as a stimulant, making him even more of an aggressive fighter and 
a delifer. Number 6, Mr. Majestic. Jim Lee, who created this character, said he wanted to explore a character who had Superman's powers but was not afraid to use them, which resulted in the character of Lord Magistros, aka Mr. Majestic. He was an alien from the planet of Kara and was their High Lord and a warlord who felt that he could be judge and jury. So, Mr. Majestic has all the powers the Man of Steel has, like super speed, strength, invulnerability, energy projection from his eyes, and all that good super stuff, plus telekinesis and telepathy, except he is essentially extremely brutal and militant. He is not afraid to use his power in the slightest, but it's still aligned to the side of good, for the most part, which does step him apart from other characters like him. He would eventually become the leader of the Wildcats for a time, and when on Earth, he would imprison criminals without a trial, and while he eased up somewhat on his ways, he never truly reverted or became completely good. There's actually an instance where he winds up in Metropolis, and him and Superman talk about their different methods, which is actually pretty cool. Number five. Void. Void's real name was Adriana Tereshkova, a Russian cosmonaut who, while on a space mission, had her craft destroyed by this crazy silver space orb that bonded with her. The orb was part of an entity named Omnia, who had passed on but had formed herself into several of these different colored energy orbs that found their way to various hosts. Void was basically, well, a void. During a battle, her face is actually literally knocked off of her body, revealing that there's nothing but energy inside of her metal shell body. One of her more useful powers was teleportation, being able to transport her teammates anywhere on Earth. She also has clairvoyance, precognition, being able to see the future, astral projection, chronokinesis, telekinesis, and energy manipulation. The greatest of those abilities was being able to see fragments of what the future held, a very useful ability that helped her and her team the Wildcats out on multiple occasions. Void at one point met the Valiant Comics character Solar, and when the two became lovers, their universes merged in a crossover event called Deathmate. So she can also merge universes together, which is, I mean, I'd say that's a pretty powerful ability. Number four, Angelus. Angelus is an immortal being who's been worshipped by people as early as the Incan Empire back in the 15th century. Her counterpart, or opposite, is the Darkness, an evil entity that has existed since the beginning of time. Now, both entities require human vessels, but the darkness follows the bloodlines of violent people, such as criminals, whereas Angelus can choose whoever she wants. Angelus has the powers of light on her side and imbues in her human host strength, speed, stamina, flight, resistance to injury from earthly weapons, and the ability to create objects of pure light. On top of that, any host of Angelus can recall the memories of previous hosts, which is an extremely useful ability if you really think about it. Angelus does have a bit of a weakness though. To maintain a presence in the body she's occupying, the host body must be in light. Being in complete darkness can drain Angelus and cause death to the host, but Angelus would be fine, so I mean, not the worst of weaknesses, really. Number three, Invincible. Now, I was going to choose Omni-Man for this top spot, but given how many Superman but brutal characters there are out there and how boring that is now, I wanted to talk about Mark Grayson himself. Mark is a member of the race known as the Viltrumites, which are a group of extremely powerful aliens who, due to their diminished numbers, go solo out into the universe to conquer planets for their empire. Mark's dad, Omni-Man, is the most powerful superhero on Earth, until one day he reveals his true Viltrumite mission and does battle with his son, who convinces him to the error of his ways. Now, Viltrumites are basically immortal. They age at an extremely slow rate, which slows down even further as they mature, eventually stopping altogether. They also get stronger and stronger with age, and every time they are defeated or gravely hurt in combat, they will heal, very quickly I might add, to be even more stronger than they were before. Viltrumites can also fly and survive the vacuum of space. Mark, his dad, and another Viltrumite flew through the core of a planet completely destroying it, and Mark himself has defeated people much more powerful than him with sheer willpower and determination. He eventually becomes a galactic peacekeeper, bringing the whole universe to a state of complete peace and prosperity. He's actually a really great dude. Number two, Supreme. Another Superman-like character. Yay! Don't hate me, please. Please. 
Supreme is known as a prime hero in his universe, meaning he is basically Superman, but more of an homage to the character. The origin of how Ethan Crane gained his powers is a little confusing. There have been two main writers, with the second one, Alan Moore, making him a heroic character, having him exposed to Supremium radiation, turning his hair white and giving him flight, incredible strength, near invulnerability, super senses, the ability to project heat beams from his eyes, and speed supreme when he was five years old. He fought in World War II, then decided to go off world and experience almost half a century of space adventures. When he returned to Earth, he was confronted by the Youngblood team, who didn't believe he was who he said he was. He's able to defeat their strongest character, Die Hard, within seconds. And that kind of changes their minds. But now, Supreme has to deal with a very different time period. So in a way, he's almost like Captain America 2, which is kind of a cool combo to have. And number one, it's Spawn. Todd McFarlane created the character Spawn in May 1992, and this character popped off, selling an epic 1.7 million copies, and he is definitely one of the characters that put Image Comics on the map, and that's an impressive superpower indeed. Spawn tells the story of Al Simmons, a Marine who died in the line of duty and makes a deal with the devil, or more specifically, male Baldia, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, to come back to life to once again be with his wife, Wanda. Simmons returned to the land of the living, but was bonded to an organic super suit that had an extremely long list of powers of its own. Some of his powers include <clears throat> flight, invisibility, phasing, healing factor, shape-shifting, necromancy, superhuman endurance, reflexes, agility, senses, and stamina, telekinesis, telepathy, memory manipulation, time manipulation, transmutation, cosmic awareness, chlorokinesis, geokinesis, weather manipulation, hydrokinesis, and immortality as long as his head is intact. Oh, he also has this thing called the Black Dispersal, which allows Spawn to call upon creatures of darkness and sin who will attack beings of light, but who Spawn can also control. These creatures include wolves, bears, worms, and bats, which is kind of rude to all those animals. Spawn also has necroplasmic energy manipulation, which basically equates to vast magical powers, which used to have a limit of 9,999 uses, but were only limited by his imagination. He's been able to conjure up a car key, materialize a box of fine wine for his friends, and even resurrect the dead at the cost of his necrometer. Spawn initially starts out in the shadows, fighting street criminals, but eventually takes the fight back to male Bulgia, kills him, and becomes the king of hell. Number 10, Christopher Welland, or Kid Spawn as I like to call him. I don't know if that's like an actual term that we've ever used, but yeah. Christopher is one of the lost souls who is kept within Spawn's heart. He acts as an ally to Spawn and later goes on to kill the serial killer Billy Kincaid. His story is that he ended up dying but was preserved by the Man of Miracles, who promises, while appearing as the Green Lady, that he will save Chris and one day return him to his mother. Save. Save. <laughs> it's not quite what happens, but still. The Man of Miracles keeps his promise, and his mother is then able to move on with her life, getting the closure she needed after her son's death. So he saved him more to just be like, He's still around and you can move on now, but he's still dead. But either way, Chris would be needed by Spawn, and so the Man of Miracles sent him there. Christopher has some of the powers of a Hellspawn and is able to use his costume as a weapon and save Spawn by helping him to remember his true identity. Christopher first appears in issue 150 of Spawn, and he's got a pretty interesting story arc if you want to check it out. I think you should check it out. It's pretty interesting, in my opinion. If you think the things that I think are interesting are interesting, you should check it out. That's what I'm gonna say. Number nine, Chibi Spawn. Chibi Spawn appears in the comic Spawn Kills Everyone, a story featuring the chibi version of Spawn attending what appears to be San Diego Comic Con. They refer to Hall H, so yeah, to discuss a new Spawn movie being released. He is super confident that his movie will blow every other superhero movie or TV show out of the water. But when he comes up against patrons and cosplayers attending the con who don't seem to acknowledge his greatness, he kills them in cold blood, echoing a scene out of Deadpool. He even makes a comment about his victims being dead in a pool of blood. Get it? Dead pool? Dead pool. Dead and pool are also very largely printed. Ha 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 ha. Comic jokes. His most powerful moment, though, is probably when he goes on to take out his own creator, Todd McFarlane, who he kills for insisting on how cute Chibi Spawn is. For some reason, I want to say that Todd McFarlane is actually not the creator of Spawn and that I said that name wrong. I wrote it just from my mind, but I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. I'm questioning everything. I feel like it's because there's a few McFarlanes in the world, is there not? 
Who's the other McFarlane? Seth McFarlane. He's the one that makes all the shows and is Family Guy and stuff, right? Are Todd McFarlane and Seth McFarlane related? That would be so weird. I don't think that's a thing. Number eight, Hellspawn. Hellspawn comes to us from a spin off series and is technically Al Simmons, but I'm almost certain features a version outside of the main continuity. I'm pretty sure this is outside of the main continuity. Hellspawn was a series written by Brian Michael Bendis and Steve Niles, with art by Ashley Wood and Ben Templesmith. It offered a much darker look at the world of Al Simmons and the enemies and victims he would be involved with. Pretty surprising, really. I mean, how much darker? can Spawn get, you might ask. It's already a pretty grim and often disturbing world and series in terms of the various events and villains depicted, and just how metal it looks. Like, it looks really metal. Can we all agree? I think we all agree on that. Well, you need to check out these alternate adventures for the character to really find out just how much darker it is. Even the artwork should give you an idea of how much darker this take from the early 2000s was. I mean, just look at this art. It's literally dark. It's very dark. We're talking Marvel's runes levels of dark, friends. Number seven, Medieval Spawn. Medieval Spawn was Sir John of York in life, a medieval knight. He made his first appearance in the Spawn universe in issue number nine of Spawn. Medieval Spawn would go on to team up with another badass in a Witchblade crossover in 1996. Oh yeah, Spawn and Witchblade, two awesome badass characters. Medieval Spawn would team up with the medieval Witchblade, if you will, Katarina Godliff. How fitting. He helped fight alongside Katarina during the invasion of the elven world of fairy. Both he and Witchblade banded together to defend the realm and fight off the invasion. Image also released another team up later on titled Medieval Spawn and Witchblade, though this version is quite different, with Medieval Spawn being known by the name of Leith in life, or Lyth, who became ensorcelled and betrayed his king, and the Witchblade being a young girl named Starling, who finds the artifact and, who it's implied, comes from a long line of witches herself. Medieval Spawn only ranks so low because the original version from the 90s at least happened to walk into a trap laid by Hellspawn hunter Angela while he was still getting used to his role as a Hellspawn. Don't worry though, Medieval Spawn still lives on despite being slain as he's since been resurrected. Which I feel like happens a lot in Spawn, people getting resurrected. Number 6, War Spawn. Captain Thomas Coram was an English soldier and his ties to Al Simmons' family later down the line. But before any of that transpired, he also fought in the First World War. War Spawn made his first appearance in issue 179 of Spawn. We later learned that he had a secret love affair with an African American woman, which was considered taboo at that time in history. They had to hide their love, but his paramour Selma ended up leaving after having their child Michael. She basically couldn't deal with the fact that they had to keep their love a secret, and she was like, Tell me you love me or I'm gone. So she left. Michael would eventually grow up to become a soldier and ended up serving in the First World War under his father's command. Unable to stop Michael from joining the army, Thomas promised Selma that he would keep their son safe. It was after Michael died that Thomas made a deal with male Bolgia to become a hellspawn in exchange for his son's life. Michael's family line would eventually lead to Wanda, Al Simmons' widowed wife, who was therefore Thomas's descendant. Haha, -ha, the connection. Number five, Gunslinger. Gunslinger is one of the most popular of the alternate hellspawns to exist. He made a deal in exchange for getting revenge for his murdered family back in the day. Gunslinger spawn is Jeremy Winston, who before he married his wife was a preacher. For the most part, he was a peaceful sort, referred to by the nickname of Old Job. But after the death of his family, he made a deal with the fallen angel Mammon and became Male Bolgia's servant. He got revenge for their deaths, but also killed every single person in the town, except for one, which Mammon had forbid him from harming. Gunslinger spawn made his first appearance in issue 119 of Spawn. Number 4, Lord Covenant. Before the spawn of the medieval ages, there was the Dark Ages spawn. And if you thought medieval spawn was dark, wait till you meet this guy. He went by the names Black Knight, Dark Knight, or Lord Covenant. Because his name is Covenant. You get it. He was originally a well-respected ruler named Ian Covenant, who went to go fight in a holy war, seeking redemption for having an affair with his sister's most lovely handmaiden. I don't know why I added that qualifier, most lovely, but she was lovely, so I just call it like I see it, I guess. However, during his time away, he would die and end up making a deal with male Bolgia that he didn't fully understand and later became reincarnated as a Hellspawn. This version of Spawn first appeared in Spawn The Dark Ages, issue number 
number one. Number three, all new She Spawn. While Nyx was the first one to take up the mantle as She Spawn, Jessica Priest wears the moniker now, and she looks good while doing it. Jessica Priest wears the moniker and the looks of it now, and boy does she wear it well. Jessica Priest is one of the world's greatest assassins who would end up being recruited by Jason Wynn, and in a twist, be the actual person responsible for killing Al Simmons. Aha! At least, we think so. That whole part of Al Simmons' backstory has kind of gone all over the place, truth be told. Retcons galore over there. Jessica, when she was just five years old, ended up admitting to burning her house down with her parents inside, and was found roasting marshmallows on the fire when the police came to get her. Yeah, that's the kind of level of crazy assassin she is. She believes it's her responsibility to take out all the jerks in the world, which is why anytime she's been released from prison, it usually results in her killing a bunch of people. There are, after all, a lot of jerks out there in the world. Recently in the comics, Jessica resurrected Nyx after finding her dead, and in so doing, also somehow became the new She Spawn. Number 2, Cogliostro. If we're talking about willpower and smarts, Cog has to be one of the most powerful versions of Spawn around. Cog was a hell spawn who refused to give up his life to male Bulgia once his powers were drained. To avoid this, he always held on to one last sliver of his power and refused to use it until he could find a way to free himself. Cog became the mentor of Al Simmons when he first returned to the world as another hell spawn. Long ago, Cog was known by the name Kane and has had many other famous names throughout the years including Faustus and Merlin. Cog is the same Cain, by the way, from biblical lore, the first killer who slew his brother Abel. His greatest ambition in life was to rule hell, which was what he also did when he betrayed Spawn in issue 120, seizing the crown of hell for himself. Number 1, Omega Spawn, or Lord Omega. This is an alternate version of Al Simmons himself, one much darker and much, much more powerful than the original, at least at a glance. Omega Spawn was a version of Al Simmons who was given unlimited necro power and reign over hell by both Melbulgia and Satan, and he is from another alternate reality, if you will. Recently, he is mentioned in Spawn's universe in issue number one, where it seems he has some plans for all the Spawns running around in the universe. And if you're wondering how he got here, he was uh, sort of dead, but then brought back to life. So he's back again, and he was also brought over to the main continuity. So yeah, that all happened if you were out for a while. That's what happened while you were out. In Spawn's universe issue number one, he has those who serve him set up to capture and confine these other alternate Spawns. Well, including original spawn, who's not really an alternate. And as for the alternates, it's Cog and Gunslinger who are up in uh, being imprisoned. Fortunately, Spawn and the Gunslinger get away, but time will only tell what Omega Spawn is planning and what he wanted the other spawns for. Number 10, Sold Out. Issue number 7 of Radiant Black marked the beginning of their second major story arc. Even though, yes, the story title itself was a continuation of one that started back in issue 5. Still, this was really the beginning of the second story arc, just trust me. It also marked a pretty impressive accomplishment for the Image series, which sold out issue 7 completely at distributor level, meaning that they had to to order a reprint for that issue so that they could meet the demand of fans of the series. In other words, if you're not reading Radiant Black, this could be a great time to jump on. The series has been celebrated by readers, reviewers, and even fellow comic book creators and writers alike, and started strong at the beginning of that second arc by completely selling out of the first printing. An impressive feat, especially for the beginning of a new arc, which, you know, tends to be when people will tap out potentially when it comes to a series, not jump in. I feel like this series has been the opposite of that. It's like every issue, there's like more and more people that get into it. I love it. Number nine, Kyle Higgins. If you have ever thought to yourself, Radiant Black seems a lot like Power Rangers, but different and a little bit more mysterious, there is a reason for that. Kyle Higgins is one of the creators behind Radiant Black. Higgins spearheads the writing part of this series, and you might recognize his name if you happen to already be a mega Power Rangers fan. He's the writer who was also behind the Power Rangers series at Boom Studios, or at least he was one of the key members of that original Power Rangers creative team, often referred to as the head writer or main writer when they started doing the comics over at Boom. You might also recognize Kyle's name from work he's done for DC, mainly in the Batman wheelhouse. After the success of Power Rangers, it would make sense that Higgins would want to branch out and do his own thing, without the limitations that come with the Power Rangers IP. Hence probably why Radiant Black seems more like an adult, more mature take on that premise. Co-creating Radiant Black gives Higgins the freedom to create his own world with its own parameters, where he can go and take these characters and just 
play. Honestly, these characters are all really great too and very real so far. Number eight, Marcelo Costa. And it makes sense too if you also recognize Marcelo Costa's name and happen to be a Power Rangers fan. Well, he might not belong to that original creative team, Marcelo Costa would eventually join the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers series at Boom Studios, working as an artist and colorist for that publisher. He also has done work for their Firefly series as well. However, his first work for Image Comics has been on Radiant Black, where he is co-creator of the series as the main and initial artist, working alongside his fellow co-creator, Kyle Higgins. Number seven, Cowl, or C-O-W-L. Something fans of Higgins may have noticed, but others may have missed, is the mentioning of Cowl, which stands for Chicago Organized Workers League, the world's first superhero labor union. In the world of Radiant Black, Cowl is its own superhero franchise, which Marshall announces is finally getting a remastering. I assume the film version of the Cowl story is getting a remastering, but he could also be referring to like a game. However, over at Image Comics, Cowl is actually actually its own comic series from 2015, written and co-created by, you guessed it, Kyle Higgins. Cowl was actually Higgins' first title that he put out with Image, and it's really cute and neat that it gets a shout out and gets incorporated into the world of Radiant Black, even if it is kind of in a meta way. Like Cowl, I don't think are actual, well, we won't see any of the characters from Cowl, you know what I mean? Cowl isn't the only Image Easter egg, by the way. There are lots of little gems for fans scattered about these comics. Let us know in the comments some of your favorites if you've been reading along, and if you'd want a list featuring some of the ones we found thus far. Also, let me know if you spotted Savage Dragon. Where is Savage Dragon in this series? Little trivia, little trivia game for everybody in the comments. Number six, a refreshing change in tone. Right off the bat, Radiant Black sets itself up to be a very different kind of series. As I said earlier, it's like a Power Ranger series without any of the restrictions or kind of censorship possibly imposed due to it being more oriented towards kids or all ages. Radiant Black starts off introducing us to its protagonist, Nathan, who is a struggling writer deep in debt and forced to turn to driving for a paralleled form of Uber or Lyft in order to try and stay afloat. Also, my apologies if that's actually mentioned in the series. I think at one point I maybe see an app. I can't remember now, but um, yeah, if there's an actual name for this service in the comics, I'm sorry that I didn't mention it. Nathan is denied a loan that he desperately needs by the bank and has a breakdown in the first scene that we meet him in, all while on the job of driving folks around. Ugh. And he is forced to pack up and move home because he needs financial help. If you're an adult living in 2021, trying to make it on your own, doing just about, well, anything, this struggle feels very grounded and very real. I personally have had breakdowns like this before in my life. This isn't Power Rangers. This is a real life world where the supernatural completely derails its characters, who are already rich with character development just from our looks into their daily lives. Number five, issue number six. Ah, it's a shame that this isn't the number six point, but Oh well. Issue number six is another standout issue when we're talking about just the roller coaster of a story and character development that is the Radiant Black series. It shifts gears and allows us to get a story from a different perspective than our standard protagonist. Instead of it being about Radiant Black, this story focuses on Radiant Red, who many of us were surprised to find out is a woman named Satomi. Not only do we get to learn some of the surprising backstory of this character, but Kyle Higgins also used this opportunity to give another writer a chance to have their voice heard. For issue number six, he brought in a guest writer and his friend, Cherish Chen. He brought Chen in because to him, it just made a lot of sense. Higgins stated, I'm not Asian American. I didn't grow up living those experiences and added that he wanted to help out other writers as he had been helped before when he was just coming on the scene. A lot of people helped me when I was coming up, he said, and it's always been a dream of mine to be able to one day give someone those opportunities as well. Making issue six an all around very cool and very special issue for the series, especially considering it also features the stunning artwork of Darko La Fuente as well. Number four, more than one. When it comes to Radiant Black, Nathan is introduced to us as just one of the characters who ends up with a sort of symbiotic suit with powers that seem to be alien in origin. He is Radiant Black, but there are other colors that are introduced to us throughout the series. I know black isn't a color, by the way, it's a shade, but let's not get technical. I don't know why I'm saying let's not get technical. People are gonna get technical in the comments, it's just how it goes. Though the series does seem to focus on the Radiant Black member more often, we are also introduced throughout to Radiant Red, Radiant Yellow, and Radiant 
pink primarily. Another cool thing about this story is that the diversity feels more genuine and balanced in comparison to the superhero team that we know and love as the Power Rangers. Not trying to knock the Power Rangers, just saying that there's some stuff in here that I think is, is more well done. Also, you know, as an adult reading it. Does that make sense? Oh, and not all the Radiants are inherently good either, which I also love. They're all just people and each of them has their own idea when it comes to the best way to use their newly inherited powers, meaning that not all of them can be considered the heroes. At least, not initially. I'm looking at you, Radiant Red. Number three, challenging tropes. Another amazing thing about this series and something that has put it on a similar level for most comic book fans in terms of the excellence of Invincible is that it takes comic book tropes and sort of puts them on their head Head or like turns them inside out. What I'm saying is this is a series that will surprise you. Almost straight out of the gate, something happens to our protagonist Nathan in issue four that completely shakes up the series. Spoilers for those who haven't read, spoilers. He becomes critically injured, passing on the power of Radiant Black to his best friend Marshall. And I gotta say, I love that in a superhero comic. It's part of the reason I love Invincible, and it's a big part of the reason that I love the Amazon Prime live action adaptation of the boys comic series. I like that element of surprise. I like when stories challenge our expectations, especially in a genre that is already so established and kind of formulaic, like the superhero sci-fi and fantasy genre. It keeps me guessing and it keeps keeps me coming back for more, and hopefully it does that for you too. Number two, the unchosen. The cool thing about the radiance we meet in this story as well is that unlike other superhero stories, they weren't necessarily chosen. Or if they were chosen, the reasoning really remains to be seen here. They weren't granted these powers by some like omnipotent force of good, like the Power Rangers overall guide and leader Zordon. They weren't brought together by a teacher and altruist like Professor X. They're just a team of folks who randomly stumbled onto these powers and in to this strange new world. They weren't intended as a gift for these people. In fact, the forces behind the powers actually very much want them back and are willing apparently to get them back at any cost. Number one, Cosmic Slash? While initially Radiant Red was the major antagonist of the series, the Radiants have finally been forced to come together, strangers that they may still be, to fight a common enemy. A mysterious hooded figure appears at the end of issue number five of the series. This antagonist, it seems, has come to Earth to take back the powers that ended up here, attached to our current Radiance by any means necessary. This antagonist was so epically powerful that the four Radiants were forced to come together to fight against them. Potentially not just stopping them from taking back the powers and suits they've bonded to, but also potentially saving the Earth from destruction? As I said, any means necessary. This antagonist was given the nickname of Cosmic Slash by Radiant Black and identified only as 001. They also seem to have some strange and mysterious connection to an entity that resides within Marshall's Radiant, which we see during the Radiant's fight against 001. However, Marshall is left confused by this whole revelation, which means, you guessed it, he's now looking within and putting everything on the line as he seeks answers. But I'm not gonna say anything more about that, because that's issue nine and that's spoilers. And that issue is more current, so I won't spoil that one for y'all. Number 10, Luther Strode himself. At the beginning of the story, Luther Strode was a pretty scrawny high school kid. He was a nerd, he liked playing video games, and he had very few friends. Namely, he had his best friend Pete. He also lived with his agoraphobic mother, who was a really great mom despite how much she worried about her son's well-being. Luther grew up in a pretty unhealthy environment with his dad being an incredibly negative force for both him and his mother. Luther's father was physically violent with his son and wife up until he was sent away to jail. Luther has a crush turned lover in the form of Petra, an edgy girl in school who had been interested in the tall, lanky nerd for the longest time, even before he was introduced to the Hercules Method. Number 9. The Method The Hercules Method was a book that Luther came upon that offered promises of quote unquote getting buff today, and offered a mindset that would allow the practitioner to experience extraordinary change, which Luther wanted in his life. It turns out that the Hercules Method was actually an incredibly old text containing ancient techniques that allowed Luther to rework his body and unlock lock the strange talents buried deep within. The key to the Hercules method is, quote, to focus your mind, body, and spirit towards one goal. By bringing all three into alignment, the physical enthusiast can bring all of them under his control. Such control is the key to change, extraordinary change. And change is exactly what Luther experienced. Number eight, changing. Although he hadn't undergone much of a physical change yet, Luther already began experiencing changes to his body. For starters, he was now incredibly hungry, but he also saw his mother dropping some plates before it actually happened and was able to catch them safely. When he was at school, his friend Pete physically pushed him into an interaction with Petra, an interaction 
unnoticed by the bully Paul, who tries to embarrass Luther. But oh, how the turntables! As Petra instead gave Luther a big old smooch and said Luther was more of a quote unquote real man than Paul was. Later in gym class, while playing dodgeball, Paul tries to hit Luther with an incredibly hard dodgeball to the face, and not only does Luther catch the ball without looking, he sees all the ways Paul could dodge and throws the ball so hard back at the bully that it hits him in the face, causing him to fall backwards with his nose gushing blood and left his nose broken with a bruised face. Number seven, strength. So obviously Luther has gained a buff to strength. It's further shown when Paul confronts Luther and Pete in the washroom. Getting ready to give Luther a beat down, Paul makes the grave error of calling Petra a bad word. And Luther don't like guys who disrespect women. He lets Paul know that by giving him one hell of a punch to the face that dislocates his jaw and gives him a serious case of whiplash. In fact, Luther's transformation sees him grow about a foot taller and put on almost 50 pounds of pure muscle in the end. His strength is eventually elevated to a point where he can rip people in half without effort, he can break wood easily with his bare hands, and he even bends steel. His strength allows him to lift at least a ton without much effort. He's also incredibly durable and resilient, almost completely impervious to most damage with bullets not even being able to pierce through his incredibly thick muscles. But it's not just his strength and resilience that have been improved. Number six, his senses. As I mentioned earlier, Luther was able to see his mom dropping plates before it actually happened, and could see all the ways Paul would be able to dodge his dodgeball before he threw it. This is because Luther's senses have also been improved through the method, allowing him to see, hear, smell, feel, and taste things that us regular humans can't. He can see through people's skin, organs, bones, and muscles, meaning he can assess damage inflicted on others and on himself. But he also has a degree of accelerated probability. He can see the possible ways that an enemy might attack, allowing him to act accordingly to defend himself or defend others. He can even feel these things happening without actually seeing them, like when Pete went to put his hand on Luther's shoulder and Luther instinctively smacked it away without looking. Thanks to this and his strength, he has an unfathomable amount of super speed, moving so fast that he is almost a blur to his enemies. He can catch a punch mid-throw, move behind an enemy before they can even react, and can even dodge bullets, even if he doesn't always need to. Number five, becoming a hero. Being a big old nerd, a fan of video games and comic books, Luther's friend Pete, upon realizing the potential of Luther's abilities, after Luther saved a woman from two robbers in a convenience store, convinced Luther that he needed to use these gifts and abilities to help people, to become a vigilante. He created a mask and uniform for Luther that is actually one of my favorites I've seen in a while. It's pretty cool. Luther went off jumping from rooftop to rooftop looking for crime to fight and just as he was getting bored, he stumbled on a man and woman in an argument just as the man was starting to get physical. And as we know, Luther don't like that. Luther stepped in stopping the man before the woman began to hit Luther with her purse. Luther definitely gave up on helping her but still made sure she was safe from a distance before calling it a night. He would later use his powers against organized crime but we're still in origin territory right now so we'll forget about that for now. Number four, the librarian. The first the first major antagonist of the first volume of Luther Strode was another practitioner of the killer method called the Librarian. He was bald, incredibly physically fit, and very very weird, but he also was incredibly brutal. The librarian had been systematically and brutally de-lifing all the people who had been stopped by Luther. He brutally took out the bully, Paul, and his whole family at their dinner table. He took out the two criminals who tried to rob the convenience store while they were being taken to prison. And lastly, he showed himself to Luther, interrupting the protagonist as he was beating up the boyfriend who was getting physical with his girlfriend. He seemed to be quote unquote finishing the job for Luther, and encouraged Luther to do it himself, which being the hero, he refused. The librarian knocked out Luther and when he came to, the librarian explained who he was and the origins of the method. The librarian launched into a speech that revealed that the Hercules method that empowered Luther had ties all the way back to the very first murderer and was actually the, called the killer method. The librarian then went on to reveal that he had been tasked with discovering a practitioner of the method. He claimed that Luther was close to perfection as he had ever seen, only Luther refused to become a crazed killer like he wanted. The librarian caused the passing of Luther's father, best friend Pete, and Luther's mother, which was all the motivation Luther needed to rip the librarian's spine from his body, literally. Number three, Kane. As the librarian mentioned, the killer method has ties all the way back to the first person to ever commit the crime of murder. 
This person being the biblical Cain, who de-lifed his brother with a rock. According to the comic, Cain is the one who created the method. He has used the method all the way back in ancient times to grow strong, wise, and incredibly powerful. So much so that he could defeat whole armies with his bare hands. He wrote down the knowledge he acquired of this method into a series of texts that over thousands and thousands of years eventually became what was packaged as the Hercules method to lure more and more practitioners in. But more than this, and what I haven't mentioned yet, is that the method allows the user to actually become immortal and stop aging. Meaning Cain is in fact alive and as the trilogy continues, he turns out to be the number one bad guy. Of all the adversaries Luther faces, Cain is the strongest and most powerful of them all and it takes everything Luther's got plus the help of his allies to even take this guy on in the first place. Number 2. Other Method Men Before Luther can come face to face with Cain, however, he faces many other method practitioners. Other than the librarian and Cain, there are several other fighters who come into the path of Luther Strode. There is the Binder who is charged with restraining any method user who gets too powerful and makes up for his lack of equivalent speed and strength against Luther with his skill and preparation. There's also the Twins who probably had some of the best backstories and development of all the method users, although only one of them put up a good fight. There are the Guardians who were the last line of defense before facing Kane and they were no pushovers. But last and certainly not least was the historical Jack the Ripper who is one of the creepiest fastest and most terrifying practitioners of the method in the whole story and puts up one hell of a good comic book fight. And at number one, the movie. With Image Comics, the strange talent of Luther Strode being universally acclaimed and selling out all over the world, the writer Justin Jordan and the artist Trad Moore went on to become two critically acclaimed comic book powerhouses working with both Marvel and DC. They went on to create two more follow-ups to Luther Strode's story in 2012's The Legend of Luther Strode and 2015's The Legacy of Luther Strode, which finally completed the story. More recently, production company All Nighter has announced that they will be adapting the series alongside Jordan and more, with Jordan actually adapting the comic to the screenplay. Jordan said in a statement, All Nighter is dedicated to staying true to all the foundations, from the tone to the mythology, and of course, the kinetic action exemplified by Trad's artwork that people have loved about the comic." End quote. With the creator of the series on and promoting the project, I have faith that they will create an awesome film. 